So I wanted to jump right into what I heard from you on that day that we first met. You have a wonderful story about how you got started, which was what intrigued me to invite you onto the podcast. And you went to school for architecture and for art. You got to tell us what transitioned you into the ice cream business. Connect the dots for us. Yeah, so... um... I, did, I, I do have a non-traditional background, which I feel like we, I've found many and um, food takes kind of like all likes. It's really interesting, but um, mine is definitely a, uh, a unique one. I was studying architecture and design um, at UC Berkeley. And I always, I think, wanted to find a way, one, to um, uh, like, how can we break down the barrier of like the intimidation to something that's really interesting and cool and creative was one piece. And then I'm a believer that like, you have to beat the the system, the institution from within. You have to understand how something works in order to break it apart. And so I was sort of searching for to solve these two things. And my real light bulb moment came by accident, as they often do, which is I was in uh, my architecture studio, and I had made this scale model, and my professor said it looked like a layer cake, as though that was a criticism. <laughs> thought, you know, why is that bad? And so I went home and I baked the next iteration of the model as a cake. And I had so much more fun doing this project than anything I'd ever done. I fell in love with this idea of, of food connecting to design, two of my ultimate passions. I knew I would never be bored of it. It was my only all-nighter in all of architecture school, which is another story. <laughs> um, but also when I presented it to my colleagues the next day, I could just see the, the intrigue and the um, excitement around the, this like just new terrain. And, you know, when you bring food to the party, it just engages people to memorable. I, I guarantee you they would remember that presentation and project almost over anything else, just because food's involved. Um, so I thought, this is it, this is what I wanna do. This is how I'm gonna make architecture and design more fun and approachable. And also just kind of take the skill set that I've been learning and, and apply it in a totally unique way. So I continued to do all these like food and architecture projects and um, it kind of built like a little mini cult following at Berkeley. And then I continued to do it in grad school where it was like slightly less well received, but I think that- Why was it less received in grad school? I don't know if they were getting it. I just think it was like um, maybe just too strange or maybe I wasn't focused enough on like the, the rigor of a traditional architecture and design and, you know, kind of- a lot of the mechanics of it, um, you know, and I was a really young student. I went straight from undergrad to graduate school, you know, so I was like 21 years old when I was starting and, you know, still learning yourself, still, still learning how you want to talk about your passions. And why yeah. did you go from, so, so let's just back up for one second, because I want yeah. to understand the layer cake. What was yeah. the assignment? It was, you know, I remember uh, it was a, it was supposed to be student housing, and it was on this like strange sort of strip of land, like a median. And so my idea was, what if you could like make the design as though you like extruded the land out of the earth and thought oh, about cool. the different kind of layers of the of the the tectonic plates, and that sort of inspired um, how you program the building. So you can imagine how you know when I got through that first exercise, it looked like a piece of cake. It was also That's like triangular if you saw it. In, Right, right. Yeah. Oh, that makes so much sense. And what I just want to reiterate is that you're someone who's talking about Teutonic plates, and not only went to undergrad, but graduate school for one career. And now you have a highly successful ice cream business. So for people that believe their story is just one way, there's no guarantee of one way of any story if you allow yourself the freedom to go in whatever direction you're taking. And that sounds like what you allowed yourself to do. You allowed yourself to be outside the box, even though you had this track. Like when you were growing up, were there entrepreneurs in your family or was it straight collegiate academia? Um, kind of neither, actually. It was my dad's an architect, so he was practicing. And then my mom's an animator. So I had two, like, um, I would say the common thread is, both of them had careers where they applied their creativity. Mm -hmm. um, but entrepreneurship was not even really a word that I knew until I was much older. And it certainly wasn't a goal of mine. I mean, I look back and I think about some of like my inherent skills around, um, you know, uh, just building relationships and people and thinking outside the box and, and kind of liking some rules, but then liking breaking them. So I think um, it was always there, but I don't think I had the words, which 
shows you the power of like vocabulary and words because they can they can empower you to do the mm-hmm. thing that you may not know existed. And I think part of that was, is my, my age, you know, I'm 38. So I think a lot has changed since then generationally, but also being a woman and, and the prospect of business and how, how dominated by men that felt. Um, so mm-hmm. I see it, it, today's world, whether you grow up in a, an entrepreneurial household or not, um, I think you have access in a, in a pop culture sense, almost, you know, right. uh, to what that may mean, what that may look like. You see characters and you understand, you understand the words. It's funny, just one thing to add is I'm always intrigued by uh, people that I meet who grew up in an entrepreneurial house and how they viewed their, their parents or parent, what, how many, depending on how many there were, ca- career. Right. Um, just thinking about, you know, I have a five-year-old son and a two-year-old daughter and, and how that, how that may reflect or, or relate. And, um, one thing or several, several observations is you, you, if you had entrepreneurial parents, you heard about business a lot in the house. Like you did. It, it is a huge kind of foray into that. Like you talk to those kids and they're like, they knew what was going on and they heard the, the wins and the struggles. And I think it, it, the other thing is it, it felt scary. It maybe didn't feel as stable, you know, right. like I grew up thinking like my parents will always just, they'll have these jobs, you know? Right. Um, right, but right. I think there's an awareness of like, yeah, it's you, you have different chapters, not like this is a job that you have until you retire. Right, the highs and the lows, right? So yes. when you're an entrepreneur, you might come home and say to your children, and I too have two children, where I might one minute be like, oh my god, I got like the most amazing idea, and then yeah. a week later, I'm like, it's all shit. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, <laughs> it's all <laughs> gone to hell, and then then you're like, but wait, it's been yeah. revived, you yeah. know? Totally. Exactly. It's very exciting. You have to have a personality for that. Yeah. So tell me about the name. It's Cool House. Cool House. Yes. Yes. But it's, it looks German. Yeah. It's inspired in part by Bauhaus. It's a triple entendre. Bauhaus, which is, of course, the German. Uh, it's really a lifestyle movement. You know, it's known more for the architecture, but there's amazing um, fine art, painting, sculpture, um, you know, poetry, ways of living and being, and a whole also world, um, and, and I think a way that was ahead of its time around the women of Bauhaus also, which mm. is really interesting. Mm. And um, then Rem Koolhaas is one of my personal favorite architects because he really thought outside the box and was non-traditional and brought all these different worlds into architecture, um, as opposed to, I think, for me, I was like interested in bringing architecture to other worlds. And uh, then, you know, the sandwiches kind of look like t- little tiny cold houses, you know, so... <laughs> Uh, they got I love the sandwiches lab and ice cream malls. So maybe there's something there. So ice cream. So tell me about ice cream and why you got into ice cream specifically. Do you have a specific love for ice cream or, you know, did you run this more as a business model? Like if you sell X amount of ice cream based on, you know, Mill, well, you're a vegan company, right? So you had yeah, to take no, that no. into like, where there yeah. are a lot of, you know, uh, spreadsheets and qu- cost quantification going on. It was it not yeah. that romantic? Was it all business? Yeah. Um, it definitely started from a place of heart and passion and love, which I think um, is the way I like to do business because I feel like it actually becomes a lot harder, at least personally for me, to do what you want to do if you don't have that and, and be happy. Like I just certainly know plenty of people who've crushed it in business and are rich and they still haven't really found their happiness, you know? Right. Um, and like, oh, like, what happened? I like sold my business for a hundred million dollars and I'm still, you know. <laughs> and 30. I'm still trying to, yeah, yeah. figure it out, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, so I, I believe starting from that place, but then vetting it as a business, which Freya actually helped me a lot with my co-founder and now wife and, and you know, m- mother of the, of the baby. So, you know, that, that story turned out um, pretty happily, ha- um, happily ever after. But um, I think she came in more with like, let's look at the space. What does it cost per unit? I really, you know, didn't know anything. I wasn't really vetting it in that way, even though I have a mathematical mind with something like right. architecture. Um, she asked me like, what was my cost per unit to make a sandwich? And I was like, I don't know. I spent $80 at Whole Foods. She was like, okay, we're going to go and make a pro forma. I was like, oh, so annoying. Write everything down. But I'm really glad that we made that trip to Whole Foods. And that's where we really, I think beyond kind of the basic numbers of ice cream, which are, you know, challenging, but find me a business that isn't. Um, mm. we saw just the lack of representation of the other ice cream brands on the shelf. You know, we didn't feel represented as millennials, as women, as queer women, since we were already dating. 
Freya as a woman of color. Um, we just felt like it was the same kind of no, storyless or story of white men, um, you know, yeah. and, and, and the flavors weren't exciting and did not represent anything with a different perspective, nor did the product. So we, we really saw the opportunity to do something big that we could, that would resonate with us, frankly. Right. And, and right. We just jump right on it. Yeah. I mean, if I go into the supermarket, you know, my standbys growing up were Haagen-Dazs, you know, and that was exciting back then. And then, you know, we went through the Ben and Jerry's phase. And now if you go to the cooler and you stand there and you look, you know, everything just kind of blends together. It's just like the way they're trying to stand out is they're either avocado ice cream or they're almond, almond milk ice cream or whatever, but there's no representation of any kind of founder. Yeah. I'm not seeing any kind of story jumping yeah. out at me that's inspiring exactly. me. And then I see your ice cream and I think, wow, it's like a woman run business, LGBTQ conscious, you know, vegan, which I'm less concerned about. Like yeah. I'll just eat dairy, but you know, I'm, I'm, I want to know, and I want to know more about the story of you, you know, like I had no idea till we met on the panel that you were the founder. I just saw a woman run business because I see your storefront in Culver city how much is that platform of being a woman run business or being a queer woman come up for you with investors in the boardroom? If there's been any boardrooms, um, I will tell you about that. I want to add a quick note that we, you can be vegan and eat dairy. And I'll tell you about that. Cause that's the new chapter of what we're working on at cool house. So I know okay. that sounds like a paradox, but I will share that with you. Um, but it came up a lot. I think at the time that I was really starting to raise significant capital was around 2017, 2018. And there was a desire for a lot of funds to um, kind of back that, that different vision and different perspective. I'm sorry. I'm just, <laughs> Am I keeping I you from something? It off. <laughs> So 16 I alarms. I get it. I have to keep alarms to just remember yeah, to go somewhere. I know. Just to turn off. Um, so I, um, I think there was a thirst for that. And, you know, look, is that there's, there's definitely an authentic, I think, interest in, in that. I'm sure also there's backlash and there's the funds wanting to, you know, look like they are not just investing in white men. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't matter the reason there just has to be change. Like if, if you're doing right. it for PR, you're still, do, you're still at that point, if you're funding a women run business, you're, you're giving that more of a chance. So I think that did matter a lot. I think for me, um, you can definitely see why it's so unequal because it's really staggering. It's like best case scenario, like 2% of capital goes to women. Um, wow. And, that's and low for half of the planet. And then you go to women <laughs> of color and it gets just, it, it forget just, it not yeah. out of your seat. It's just, it's, it's gross, frankly. And, um, I think it happens because the, the funds are men. And mm -hmm. so it, especially I think if you're coming, um, as a women run brand with a, a kind of female oriented concept, it really doubles down on how difficult it may be to understand, um, why that, why, what the value is or what the use is, or even some of the basic questions like that. Famously, Gwyneth Paltrow, like couldn't raise money, you know, in the early days from any of the funds that she wanted. And a lot of the feedback was like, oh, my wife's a big fan, you know, but I don't, I don't get, I don't get what you're trying to do. Right. I don't so, know what goop is. Yeah. 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 And, and you know, cause it's, it's all men and, and, and it's, um, you know, I've been in many rooms and, and talking about cool house with there's 20 people in the room and 19 of them are men and me. So it's like, it's not just like, there's a few guys sometimes if you're like hugely outnumbered. I do think for me, um, and I don't remember if I talked about this at, at Culver City High, but I've had a slightly different journey, I think, as a gay woman, because I think there's maybe a little, a little bit of a different relationship to um, a male-dominated culture where it could be slightly less threatening, um, uh, where, you know, this is a, sorry to go on a tangent, but imagine like there's a, a company is, is like all men and they want to go on a fishing trip. And, you know, I, I love fishing and I want to go and, and suddenly the wives are nervous and they feel strange and uncomfortable. And then you're like, well, you know, she's gay, she's gay. Like, oh, you know, kind of takes, <laughs> take some of that imaginary right. threat off the table. Right. And I'm not saying that's okay by any means, but there's, there's, there's definitely that. And there's also, I think um, we've all had our challenges in life. And I think I found a lot of um, lesbian like founders, CEOs, leaders, you know, there's just maybe a different relationship with, with risk or, or something that you've overcome um, mm -hmm. or maybe 
a bit more of comfort level with rejection, which I think is really challenging for a lot of women because we're sort of told that any rejection is just a complete failure on our own part. Right. So, you know, I think there's a lot more there, but, but I think it actually helped me in this case. Um, get That's farther. good to hear. That's yeah, good yeah. to hear, right? With yeah. lemons, make lemonade, right? If you yeah. think there's going to already be a bias, men as a work the system. I mean, that's what white men are doing. <laughs> Why not, right? Why not? Um, yeah. Especially if you have something you believe in. Now, we talk about books on this podcast. And, um, you know, if you were going, well, I'm going to out you that you're thinking about running for mayor. Is that still possibly the case? Okay, so, yeah. you know, running for mayor, being a political figure, being a founder, being a gay woman, sounds like there's a lot to write a book about. Have you ever thought about what you would write a book about? Such a great question. Um, I think, I think I'm, I'm, even the topic that we were just talking about, sort of the queer relationship in business is something that like definitely intrigues me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, and I'm actually um, also uh, poly. So we have an alternative, you know, we're, I, Frey and I are in a throuple right now. And- um, Wait, you're know, in a what? It's called a throuple. So we have a, a third in our a relationship. Throuple. Uh, there's yeah. a new word much more common coming out of quarantine, I must say. So we're okay. kind of like, I, would, I wouldn't say it goes far to say we're a stereotype, but you see right, it. Right, 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 and right, right. that is a topic I'm like, I, I'm, I'm very intrigued by kind of alternative um, romantic, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, scenarios Pairings. and formats. Pairings. Yes, right, this, right. this is a very dominant theme right now, just amongst friends and socially that we've been sharing about like how we've gotten on this track of, you know, um, of like you are looking for your soulmate and then, and then monogamy is the way that you're succeeding in life. And, and just, there's so many different ways we could be looking at this. And if you look at our early origins um, in, in humanity, um, we were much more of community-based. and tribal. Together. Yeah, tribal, yeah. right? But yes, now we're yeah. supposed to be this one person supposed to be the one and then people expect that person is going to serve all their needs and then they're inherently disappointed because people are disappointing. I mean, it the just pressure alone. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's yeah. so true. And then we have, you know, sexual needs. And then are they all going to be met with one person as well? And it's it's true. And then you want to have a family and then you're like, well, what am I going to portray for my children? And what are they? Yeah. Meanwhile, kids are being raised differently now where they're yeah. being taught that there is fluidity. Yes. You know, so yes. well, I applaud you for that, that there's a couple of different intersecting topics in there. You could write two <laughs> books. You could write yeah. probably, probably have a bunch of books in you. Oh, yeah. Um, so, so if you were going to, it is, you know. but I don't know about the mayoral campaign being about the thruple though. Right. That may be, a, that may be a tricky one. Yeah. But the, but the, but back to the politics, I think, um, well, I actually just on a note of that, I think it's all, it's this next generation of politics is all about authenticity and being different. Mm -hmm. So, who, who, you know, who knows? Who, I'm going to do this political training. And that's definitely one of my questions is, is, you know, leaning in and where and, and what kind of, and, and what, what, you know, that's a whole world of storytelling, just like it has been for Cool House. So, um, but yes, I, I'm really interested in, in politics. And, and I'll tell you why is I feel like coming out of this last chapter with Cool House, I've just um, sold the business work to an amazing food tech sustainability company where I'm currently working and helping with the transition. And um, I, I love business and I love, um, um, I have had an incredible journey with it, bringing a really creative out of the box dream to a, a real functioning world and, and growing a culture and, and all the just joy that it's brought me and others. Mm -hmm. um, but business is a PL at the end of the day. At the end of the day, it is about money, it is driven by money, and, and things fail and succeed based on that. And I feel like politics is very, um, I could bring a lot of the toolkit from my entrepreneurial days, raising money, the, the community, like I said, the culture, the vision, the team. Um, but you really are about um, your constituents and representing people and their needs and doing, doing, you know, doing well by, by that. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like that for me is like my calling as far as the next chapter. And I know this is coming, this is said from a place of privilege, but I think I'm much more motivated by that, having that, that, um, the, the voice and the power and the influence and that platform, I think is the right word than right. money in business. Like that, that is what makes me feel, I think, fully complete. So I, I, I'm lucky I have, I had and do have that with Cool House, but I feel like I can really concentrate on that. Um, in politics. So, so that's, that's what's sending me to that new world.
Amazing. Well, you're you're yeah. incredibly articulate and engaging, and you seem to be ready to step up to that platform. So I'll be looking for that for that <laughs> campaign. I have one last question for you before we wrap up, and it sounds like you might be moving on from the company because it sounds like you're you know have, are doing this sort of exit plan. But if you were going to create one last ice cream flavor in your tenure, what would it be? Yeah. Well, no plans to move on yet, you know. Okay, so, okay, uh, okay, yeah, okay. Right. I, I, okay, so we might get a couple ice cream flavors. But down the, the, the politics is, is my next is my next chapter for sure. But, um, you know, beyond a flavor, actually, what I would love to do is just uh, as another line of novelties. Um, we're working, on, potentially there's like the idea of bite size and bonbon type idea, or kind of reinventing like a choco taco as a taquito is something that we've been leaning into and, and sort of exploring. And if there's a will, there's a way, I believe, but I would love <laughs> to have, you know, we have the sandwiches, we have the cones. Of course, we have the pines, which are, are more of a traditional format, although not traditional flavors, but I would love to have one more amazing um, non, non-pine. So that's what we call novelty to, to give to the world um, when I'm um, maybe no longer fully full-time an ice cream lady. <laughs> wow. I love it. An ice cream taquito. Well, I'm very yeah. excited about that. And thank you so much for coming and sharing your knowledge on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I've enjoyed uh, speaking to you very much as well.